film about school broadcasting in Britain. Script, Harold Purcell. Photography, James Rogers. Sound recording, Charles Tasto. Commentary, Norman Shelley. The film was edited by Alfred Travers. Co-directed by Harold Purcell and James Rogers. Produced at Merton Park Studios. Every day, programmes go out from the BBC to schools all over Britain. They go to children in the suburbs of big cities. To children living in the heart of industrial towns, To children living in isolated rural areas. The children have good modern schools and enthusiastic teachers, but their mental experiences would be limited to their immediate locality were it not for the school radio. Today, as they listen to a description of life in China, the walls of the classroom fade away. Good morning, schools. My name is Xiu Qian. I am Chinese. My country, China, is 6,000 miles away from here. Too far away for you to be able to go there. So I want to tell you about it. There are more than 400 million people living in China. Some in cities, some on farms, and some in boats. Yes, boats. Imagine yourself standing by a wide river. You can hear the water lapping against the sides of the hundreds of boats lying along the river bank. What lies behind the story of the Chinese scene that is echoing through this English children's classroom? It was planned perhaps six months ago. In Britain, the broad outline of what shall be broadcast to the schools is laid down not by the Board of Education, but by the Central Council for School Broadcasting. This is a body of people representing educational institutions and opinions all over Britain. Practicing teachers are always represented. When it has been decided what is wanted in any particular subject, these ideas are turned into programs by the BBC. In the case of this Chinese program, for instance, a meeting was held at which the BBC official who was to be responsible for the program talked things over with a professor of geography and an authority with lifelong experience in China. A plan of research was laid down, which the official, in this case, Ms. Frieda Lindstrom, carried out. The most meticulous care is taken in ensuring that all the material for the programs is obtained at first hand from authentic sources and no pains are spared in determining the correctness of the facts that go into the scripts. And so the material was finally gathered and the series planned. In due course, writers for the particular broadcasts were appointed and set to work. The first draft was checked with Miss Lingstrom and as a result of her suggestions was written again. Then it was checked over by a professor of geography and re-read by the Chinese expert. He didn't agree with all of it and made further suggestions. A practicing teacher was called in who thought one or two of the words were a little difficult for children of that age. Finally, the director of school broadcasting read the scripts and gave them her blessing and they were handed to the producer. The principal speaker was given a voice test and the producer had various suggestions to make. In arranging Chinese music, a celeste, not a piano, was found to give the best effect.
Other music was chosen from the library and effects discs. An ingenious device enables the producer to select just that part of the disc he wants. And so at last one morning, the various persons gathered in the studio. The producer is at his controls. The time has come for the China program to go out on the air. Good morning, schools. My name is Xiu Qian. I am Chinese. And so, children, the length and breadth of Britain receive a new experience of life in another country from a first-hand source. But this is only one out of a number of programmes supplied by the BBC which the teachers are able to draw upon. Many schools make use of broadcasts by Anne Driver, Good who morning. teaches music through movement for little children. Are you all ready to spread out everywhere you can? Let's pretend we're going along a country road. Here's the walking tune. Start away with me. And along this road, something else is coming. Listen and see if you know what it is. Yes, it's a bicycle. I think it's the postman. Here he comes, pedalling along on his bicycle. You be the postman, coming along the road. Don't forget to ring your bell round corners. Off you go. and see if you can tell me what's coming this time. Yes, it's a horse. I think it's the farmer galloping along the road. Now, you sit on your horse and hold the reins. Off we go. Even children in hospital are able to join in school broadcasts. For the first time, parents are able to hear exactly what their children are being taught and often discuss the broadcasts that their children hear at school. Consider the series Stories from World History. The scope of the broadcast having been decided by the committee, Rhoda Power sets to work on research for the series and writes the scripts. But in this case, instead of one speaker facing the microphone, the stories are presented in dramatic form. BBC actors taking the various parts. This method of bringing history to life has been found highly successful. Let the night begin. Since I must begin, I do so right willingly. Let us ride on, my friends, and I will tell my tale. On then, on to the tomb of St. Thomas. To And so they rode on their pilgrimage, a merry company. But others who journeyed to the tomb of St. Thomas at Canterbury went on foot over rough roads, ploughing their way through mud, their feet slipping and splashing. Try to imagine it. In music, not only can children hear first-rate performances by our finest orchestras, but individual players show how their own instruments contribute to the whole performance. Now we'll have the little passage in which this fanfare occurs. From the universities such as Oxford, come to the microphone some of the finest scholars in the country to speak to high school pupils. Here, for example, is Sir Richard Livingstone, president of Corpus Christi College. Able thinkers discuss current affairs, writers, novelists, all sorts of people come to the microphone. From the various parts of the empire, there come people to tell of life in their own lands, impressions which go deeper into the children's minds than a mere map 
in an atlas. But always there goes on at the BBC a constant striving to find the most imaginative treatment of new ideas. For example, a series on citizenship is being discussed. The planning of new towns after the war may be one of the series. How would Sir Christopher Wren have made the broadcast? Asks the director. Why shouldn't Wren make the broadcast, says somebody? Why shouldn't he have a talk with Griswood? So the idea is born. In due course, Griswood and an actor playing the part of Wren face the microphone. But to children all over the country, this really is Wren. And he is standing, not in the studio, discussing his new plan for the rebuilding of London with Griswood, but actually in the vicinity of St Paul's itself. Discussions, of course, take place after the broadcast is over. But besides occasional and sporadic criticism, a regular criticism of every broadcast comes from a special panel of listening schools all over Britain, which have been allotted some particular programme. The teachers send in reports, and day by day, bundles of them arrive at the offices of the Central Council. These are carefully discussed with the BBC. Not backward in expressing their criticism are the teachers, in whose hands the responsibility for choosing their programmes rarely lie. And so, day by day, school broadcasting in Britain goes on. Teachers feel that they're being given new material to use. Children find their education associated with the voices of all sorts of interesting people. And remote schools are linked with the outside world. And all children are given experiences which in the old days only a few received. Young minds are set working. That broadcast about Wren may have inspired John to go to see the great cathedral for himself. Or caused Freddy to speculate about the rebuilding of the cathedral in his own town, destroyed by an air raid. To Lucy, the most vivid impression may be the music of the broadcast which she now plays for herself. Every day, into the schools of Britain, come pouring experiences drawn from all over the world. Experiences that are not conjured up by the state, but invoked by teachers and educationalists themselves through the BBC. To all these children, broadcasting is a door giving access to the finest educational fields.